Hi students, what we're going to be talking about today is Japanese rule over Korea from 1910 to 1950. This forms one of the sections of the China and Korea HL Paper 3 topic from 1912 to 1950 and it also ties into what we've looked at already in the Paper 3 topic on Japan from 1912 until 1990 and the kind of broad big inquiry question that we're going to be trying to start to develop an argument to is to what extent was Japanese rule over Korea beneficial? So just to recap in some of the things that we've already sp spoken about in terms of Japanese aggression, we spoke about this in uh, the move to global war as well. Uh, so pre-1905, um, and if you think about the situation in China um, during this period of time as well, we've had, this is after the first Sino-Japanese war. And after that, uh, Russia had obviously extended its influence into China and had been building the Trans-Siberian Railway and had acquired this naval port in Port Arthur, okay, which is down here. It's really important for Russia to um, acquire this because uh, it, is not, it is available all year round. Okay? It's not um, frozen in ice, okay, unlike their northern ports in, in Russia. Um, and Japan is obviously very fearful of this, okay? They have their own interests, okay? Um, and they double their budget in 1896. And we've already spoken about, okay, the militarism, the uh, Meiji Restoration, the impact of that, the beginning of nationalism within Japan. Um, and that is manifested in the doubling of the size of the military in 1896. So uh, Japan's interests um, in Manchuria is primarily focused on Korea. They could see that, okay, if we can extend ourselves into Korea, then we can start to look at it in terms of its um, wider ambitions in terms of resources. Uh, Russia's main interests, okay, were in controlling Manchuria itself. Um, and what this results in is the uh, Russo-Japanese War. Um, so we've already looked at in terms of Japan's internationalism during the period of time. So we've looked at the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, which was signed in 1902, you remember. Uh, which grants Japan a freer hand to confront Russia in Korea because it says that Britain is only to be involved if more than one state becomes uh, involved in a war. Um, and so you see this contest that occurs over um, Manchuria and China during this time is too weak in order to be able to defend itself. Um, and even despite the, the vastness of, of Russia, um, it had gone through some period of industrialization with much more sort of a modern period of Japan during the period of time. Uh, it was one of the great powers of Europe. Uh, Japan is able to be victorious, okay, because of their naval victories, okay, and one of which came at Tsushima in May of 27, 1905. So, in the post-Russo-Japanese War period, we have the Treaty of Portsmouth, okay, which happens in the US, in the UK, and it's ended the war and outlined that Russia ceded its concessions in South Manchuria to Japan, and they also renounced their interest in Korea. So this gives Japan the motivation and the free hands to start to invest a lot of money into Manchuria, and then also start to extend it into Korea as well. So no reparations were included, um, and this really um, evokes a lot of sort of um, hatred okay, in the streets of Tokyo because they believe that okay, well, the victors of a war should be given reparations as per all of the European wars that had happened prior to this. Um, and after the war, Korea, Korea was reduced to a formal Japanese protectorate uh, during which uh, Aito Hirobumi okay, became uh, Japan's first prime minister was brought to serve as the resident general in Korea. So during this time, Korea still has its own king. It still is has its but it is controlled and a lot of the political organization of Japan, of Korea, is controlled by the Japanese. So it's not formally um, part of the Japanese empire just yet. It is a protectionist. So it's an important distinction to make between those two terms. So the Japanese protectionate period from 1905 to 1910, the Korean emperor Kojong agreed to protectionate under duress. Um, and in both 1906 and Seven, he did appeal for world support against Japan. When he abdicated in 1907, um, we see 
much more of a stronger Japanese motivation to try to extend their influence in Korea during this time. Um, so all laws, government decisions and appointments of officials require the Japanese resident general's approval. Um, the Korean army is disbanded and from that time we see the formation of Korean guerrilla groups um, and they clash fiercely with Japanese military who were starting to flow into the country during the protection era and they clashed approximately 2,819 times. You can see Japanese officers on horseback in the narrow streets of Seoul. So once the emperor dies, it, Japan looks at this as an opportunity to extend its influence greatly. Between 1900 uh, and 1910, uh, Japanese presence in Korea multiplied tenfold, okay? They see Korea as an opportunity to extend the influence, okay, to um, get the empire that many European states have already developed. And we see here uh, that in the Article 1 of the Japan-Korea Treaty, His Majesty the Emperor of Korea concedes completely and uh, definitely his entire sovereignty over the control over Korean uh, territory to His Majesty the Emperor of Japan. So this is the formal um, takeover, annexation of Korea by Japan. Um, and what we're going to look at is from this period is okay well was this all was the impact of japanese influence all negative for korea okay were there some elements of, of offenders we can see this earlier on in the 1905 to 1910 period where J japanese financed creation of modern banking facilities roads um and the the formalization of the annexation is based on a variety of things but some of them, okay, are unpaid debts of which the Koreans owe the Japanese. And the Japanese Prime Minister that I just spoke about, Hirobumi, is actually assassinated by Korean guerrillas. And, and this leads to the um, establishment of the protection. Okay, and Japanese Times announced Japan and Korea made one. Okay, so this idea of this nationalism, this expansion against okay, so what all European states are doing during this time, okay, is building an empire. Okay, Japan feels that they need to do, need to do this in order to be a player in the world. So we're going to look at the variety of different impacts of Japanese rule in Korea. So we're going to look at political, economic, social, and also cultural elements as well. So from 1910 to 1950, the royal family and elites of Korean rule were paid off with money, uh, while the highest posts in the central state and provinces were filled by Koreans who were loyal to Japan, many of who had spent time in Japan. So we see this um, those who want to work with the Japanese are given positions of power. Those who oppose them are um, rejected and um, killed and um, discriminated against. Um, the first decade saw very much a really heavy handed military policy. Okay? So during the early period okay, in the 1910s, uh, the police had a large role throughout the country collecting taxes, enforcing laws. They were authorized to conduct administrative trials that were not subject to higher judicial review. So this is pretty much the Japanese police and the Japanese army pretty much being a law unto themselves. Um, and we see very, very harsh punishments of fines, jail terms, um, even corporal punishment with you know, bamboo canes. And we have Miyazaki here, who's the first uh, Japanese governor general of Korea. And he's a military man, okay? He wants uh, Japan to... Korea to bend to Japanese rule. Um, power was very much centralized within the governor general. Um, and even within Japan, the governor general was pretty much in control of Korea by himself. Okay, He took orders from Tokyo as well, but um, the governor general pretty much ha had his own say. Central bureaucratic power extended into the, the uh, counties and the villages. Um, and Japan used its large army in order to oppress the Japanese. So we do have some elements of um, opposition, um, yeah, but this is treated very harshly by the Japanese and, and ends very, very quickly. And it really never succeeded in disrupting Japanese rule. Um, and this is due to a, a multiple different effects, okay, partly because of the effectiveness of the Japanese oppression, but also because they didn't really have any sort of coherent vision. You think about, you know, opposition movements in the past that we've looked at, okay, why Hitler was able to raise the power is because there's no real coherent vision about what the opposition can form together in order to be able to achieve. Some nationalists wanted closer ties with the West, while others wanted traditionalist Korean values, others wanted to follow communist ideals. We see different versions of what Korea should be if the Japanese were not there. 
economically is probably the area in which Korea does best in, in terms of Japanese rule. So even though they were oppressed politically, economically, Japan's influence is, is vital in ensuring the development of Korean industry. A land survey was carried out and which overturned nearly 40,000 undocumented claims to land ownership. Um, and what this meant is that it had a devastating effect on many rural Korean fam families who now had to become tenant families by paying rent on land that had been previously owned. Okay, And we see smaller farms, the subsistence farmers, being conglomerated into larger farms. Okay, That makes agricultural um, output more efficient. New land was taken over by Japanese-owned cooperatives. Okay, so we see large farms, families, uh, farms being um, brought into cooperatives. And by 1939, most large-scale industries were owned by Jap Japanese-based corporations or by Japanese corporations in Korea. Korean companies could not compete with Japanese firms. Many enjoyed rich tax exemptions and official guarantees against losses. Korean entrepreneurs were charged interest rates 25% higher than their Japanese counterparts. So a lot of the economic benefit. Even though Korea is benefiting from the influence of Japan, it, a lot of the benefit is definitely going offshore. It's going to J the Japanese people. Um, as you can see here, Cummings talks about the uneven distributed growth. Agricultural output rose substantially in the 1920s and industrialization took root in the 1930s. Growth rates in Korea economy outstripped those in Japan itself. So we see great growth in the Japanese economy, but Who's benefiting from this? Is it just the Korean or is it Japanese as well? Um, obviously, the development of agriculture, of industry creates jobs. Okay, Employment is um, found by many Koreans. Um, they did hold mostly low-paying jobs. Um, and even if when they did have the same position, they definitely received less pay. Um, what we have in 1931 with the Governor General um, Ukaki Kashiguri, um, Japan moved to build the Korean economy as part of the empire wide program of economic self sufficiency. So we see this idea of move towards an autarky. We see the railroads, roads, ports, manufacturing industries, infrastructure, and the development of this starts to flow into Korea, which is going to benefit all people, no matter if they're Korean or Japanese. Um, you can see here that it proved advantageous to Korea's long-range prospects for economic development, but just as surely Japanese policies shortchanged Koreans in the short run. So think about it, okay, well, during the time J Japanese were definitely, Japanese businesses were definitely benefiting from their control, but in the long run, the infrastructure that was provided to Korea by the Japanese is definitely beneficial. Socially, um, in 1907, Japanese government passed a newspaper law which prevented the publication of local papers. In 1920, responding to criticisms of its harsh regime, these laws were relaxed as Japan started its cultural policy. So we're going to talk about that later on in terms of the case. So we see this very, as I spoke about before, heavy-handed measures in the beginning. We see harsh punishments. We see much more of a military-type control. Then that gets wound back. Um, and the number of schools was increased, about half of children's school age in attendance at elementary school by 1940. Um, and what happens in 1931 is the policy changes from very much a militarist policy in the early 1910s and 1920s. 1931, we see a policy of assimilation. And we see what happens with, in terms of Korea, in terms of socially, they are moved to become part of the Japanese empire. So what happens is their distinguishing cultural identity as Koreans starts to become extinguished. They start to avoid, they start to ban Korean language. They start to um, bring in J Japanese uh, religion. And what happens is we start a move in terms, of Jap in terms of Korea to becoming one with Japan. So you can see in this poster here that we see a reading, Japan and Korea teamwork community champions of the world. This is a very common um, rhetoric that is going around at this time. Slogans such as Korea and the homeland, together as one. Patriotic groups were established to promote support for war, and these increased surveillance and control over the population as well. Um, from 1935, Koreans had to recite an oath and loyalty to the emperor, and also had to worship at Shinto shrines. Um, you can see here in the photographic cases, children, um, Korean children learn Japanese culture. Um, and the kanji writing system. In 
39 was probably the most aggressive form of assimilation as we see that Koreans had to abandon their birth names and adopt Japanese-style surnames. Many of them still use their Korean names, um, but this is the idea that, okay, if you didn't have a Japanese name, you weren't able to enroll in school, you couldn't get food rations, you couldn't um, get a job. Um, so Japan, very, very effective in pushing for assimilation between Korea and Japan. Um, this modernization um, and social customs also brought about a whole range of things which have been present in Japan. So cinemas, records, radio, commercial advertising, magazines, department stores, Western fashions, okay, were all brought into the major cities um, in Korea, such as Seoul and Busan. The resistance movement that we see here is um, it changes over the period of Japanese rule. So in the earlier on, okay, we saw that the came not really that effective. Um, that is because of this really harsh, harsh rule. So, um, and what happens is Japanese rule changes depending on the amount of resistance that they find as well. So by the 1930s, there was one policeman for every 400 Koreans. So it's definitely much a very military state. Um, when the war breaks out in China in 1931, we see a relaxation of that kind of military control because a lot of soldiers go off okay, to become part of the Japanese army in, in China. Um, resentment in conjunction with the death of Emperor Kojong. Remember, this is the one who abdicates um, much earlier on. It sparked protests on May the 1st of 1919, which sought this national self-determination. This is one of the largest demonstrations that take place. Um, but they're brutally suppressed. Japanese rule did become more gentile. Okay, with uh, new businesses no longer requiring government permission and Japanese government subsidies to Korean companies as well. And military pol police were actually replaced with civilians. Um, and they no longer wore swords as kind of a very much an aggressive display of their power. Um, and censorship was relaxed, and which resulted in a boom in Korean newspaper and magazine publishing as well. So we did see this underground resistance movement as well. Um, and this beginning of this nationalism movement, um, which can be seen in the Korean Language Research Society in 1921, which promoted standardized grammatical um, and a standardized alphabet, and the development of a Korean dictionary for the first time. So due to Japanese rule, nationalists were driven abroad. Okay, so what we can look at when we look at the Cold War is that the first future president of Korea, Sigmund Marie, uh, actually went into exile in 1904. Um, and he that pops up in Hawaii, founding the Korean National Association. Um, and when we see this move towards assimilation between Japan and Korea and relaxation of this kind of military rule um, after the 1930s, we do see Japanese um, and Koreans starting to um, come to a much more mutual understanding. So see Japanese subsidies of radio broadcast in the Seoul dialect spreading throughout the nation, but it was once again suppressed during World War II, okay, after um, 1937, uh, uh, in which they sort of adopt, adopted this policy of assimilation. So it does kind of go in the waves, their level of control. So hopefully that gives you a, a broad overview of the period in terms and the terms of the impacts, both socially, economically, and politically on Japanese rule and gives you a bit of an understanding about how Japanese rule affected the Koreans. And then you can start to develop your own argument in relation to how Korea benefited or how Korea was negatively impacted by Japanese rule during the period.